Oh, hello. Let's talk about America and World War I, shall we? Please take notes on this. This will be your interactive notebook entry for this week. Here we go. All right, so we've already talked a lot of, in class about propaganda, what it is, how it's effective, what it's intending for people to do, but we also need a little bit of historical background around it. Um, so propaganda for the United States um, in World War I comes out of a government committee that's put together really quickly after the United States declares war called the Committee on Public Information, or sometimes called the Creel Committee um, because the guy who runs its name is George Creel. So the Creel Committee, um, they hire artists from all over the country, um, and as we discussed in class, they're using every medium in order to get information out to American citizens about World War I. That includes um, newspapers, magazines, posters, um, which we looked at extensively in class, as well as things like radio broadcasts for those who have radios during this time, um, telegraph messages, even uh, little newsreels that um, play before movies instead of like a preview for an upcoming attraction. Um, all of that is being used by the Creel Committee. And they have some censorship ability over this information too. They can kind of decide what's going to be included and what's not. They also hire about 75,000 individuals who they call four minute men um, who give in-person presentations that last approximately four minutes, get the name, um, and uh, they go in front of school assemblies, they go in front of union halls, uh, trade meetings, um, local community organizations, YMCAs, all this sort of stuff, and give a pitch for why people should um, support the war and in particular should buy bonds um, as a part of the war. And the Creel Commission starts out as this very sort of positive fact-based organization. A lot of their propaganda is not doing things like card stacking, right? They're really trying to, um, to be pretty fair um, and be pretty honest. And as the war goes on, they transition more and more to um, a little bit more of negative messaging, maybe more of that name calling, um, those sort of campaigns uh, over time. Um, here's a little reminder um, about them making movies. Um, kind of the U.S. official logo for war pictures, and a quote from George Creel, which you do not have to um, write down. Ooh, I misspelled George, and I'm going to read it to you right now. Um, he says, we did not call it, meaning their work in the Creel Committee, propaganda for that word in Germany, in German hands, had come to be associated with deceit and corruption. Our effort was educational and informative throughout, for we had such confidence in our case as to feel that no other argument was needed than the simple, straightforward presentation of facts. Of course, as time goes on, maybe commitment to that idea wavers a little bit. So the next thing we have to talk about is if all of these, uh, this propaganda is out there drumming up support for the war, um, we're, we're going uh, against Germany um, and the central powers, how are we going to pay for it? War is really expensive. Um, we talked a little bit in class already about government borrowing money from the American people through selling liberty bonds. Uh, and you get a nice little propaganda here about liberty, uh, liberty bonds, um, which is essentially kind of loaning money uh, back to the government. You get a return on that bond over time. It helps um, tighten up the money supply. It also means that you don't necessarily have to uh, raise taxes in order to increase the revenue that the government needs to finance something like a war. Um, that's not the only way, however, that we end up um, financing the war. Uh, bond sales are really successful. We raise over $20 billion, um, and some part of that uh, comes from these four Minute Men presentations. They also um, get Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts uh, to sell bonds as well instead of things like cookies or popcorn or whatever it is that Boy Scouts sell. Um, so there's a lot of people who are, who are really working the bond angle on, when it comes to financing the war. Um, but if you think about the number of people who we send over to Europe, it's about four million million Americans um, who will ultimately end up serving in World War I. All of those people need uniforms, they need munitions, um, we're, we're sending supplies to other allied countries as well, so we need more money. Um, we're also making loans to foreign powers during this time, so there's a little bit of interest that we will see in the future uh, based on some of those payments, but ultimately what ends up happening is President Wilson passes an act called the War Revenue Act in 1917 that increases income taxes. Income tax was a relatively new thing by the time the war started for America in 1917. The 16th Amendment, which creates the income tax in the United States, wasn't even passed until 1913, although it had been kind of sitting on the books for a really long time. Um, up until 1913, all of our individual revenue as a country had mostly come from tariffs, from taxes that were put on imported goods into the United States. So this is a major change for Americans anyway, particularly Americans who are very wealthy during this time. Um, and the War Revenue Act ends up really raising tax rates for everyone. And those won't really be scaled back ever to the levels that they were at before the war. Um, and it'll take some time. Uh, well into the 1920s, people are paying World War I era taxes. 
So speaking of taxes, let's talk about the economy a little bit. Um, there's a major growth in bureaucracy for all sorts of American businesses during World War I as they switch from commercial production to war production. Um, so, uh, so that would be switching from making something like um, maybe a car um, or a radio for personal use to making a product like that for, for war instead. Um, major manufacturing plants are doing this. Um, and a lot of the business leaders uh, very kindly um, in order to kind of help support this transition, say that they're going to only be paid a dollar a year for their salary. All of the, the savings for their corporate salary will go towards um, the production in their, in their manufacturing plant. Um, there's also a lot of government bureau bureaucrats who are added to help manage this transition. Three um, major boards that I want to talk about. Uh, the first one is the War Industries Board, which is in charge of raw materials um, and basically tells manufacturers what they need. Do we need tanks? Do we need planes? Do we need sh shotgun shells? Whatever it is that needs to be produced, the War Industries Board is basically going to direct companies to do that. They also end up fixing prices. So. Typically, in a free market economy, supply and demand uh, will determine how much a product is worth, how much consumers are willing to pay for it. But in order to make this transition happen faster and really keep it um, as cheap as possible, the War Industries Board um, fixes prices for a lot of these war materials during this time. There's another group called the War Trade Board, um, which actually ends up uh, punishing any firms that they suspect might be still illegally trading with enemy nations. Once you declare war on a country, it makes it a little bit more complicated to have a trade relationship with them. Um, so the War Trade Board will, will go out and find you if you're breaking that rule. And then finally, the National War Labor Board um, works to resolve any sort of labor disputes. So that would be unions who are maybe threatening to go on strike or to walk out on the job at a time when those workers are particularly needed. Um, and they work, are working directly with Samuel Gompers, who you might remember from our studies um, during the Progressive Era, as well as other leaders during this time. There's also a lot of um, uh, responsibility that falls on the shoulders of just everyday Americans, particularly uh, women and children to a lesser degree, people who are maybe left back at home on the home front during the war. Um, and the idea behind this is rationing, right? Um, thinking about our propaganda purposes, this is conservation, this idea that food is going to win the war, maybe even more than soldiers or bullets are going to win the war. There's um, an act passed called the Lever Food and Fuel Control Act, um, which gives the president power to manage production and distribution um, of all consumer goods during this time. Um, there's also a food administration who's led by a gentleman named Herbert Hoover, um, who will go on to become president because he's so good at doing his job in World War I and people really like and trust him, um, that is uh, going to kind of administer this whole rationing um, pro process. So rationing means that you can't just go to the supermarket and buy as many pounds of beef as your little heart would de desire. You are maybe only allotted a certain amount every week or every month. Um, you might have to give them a ration ticket to show that you haven't already gone over your quota. And the idea is that we're able to save food and money and time and energy that it takes to grow food as an entire society as a result of that. So the Food Administration, um, they, they uh, set um, price controls, much like um, the War Industries Board is doing uh, for, for products. Um, and they really appeal directly to women as the people who are doing the shopping for the home, who are making those domestic decisions about what are you going to purchase. Are you going to purchase a pad of butter or are you going to maybe try to use something else instead? We also see um, during World War I is uh, where we have the start of daylight savings time my nemesis every spring. Um, the idea here is that we can lower fuel consumption by relying more on natural light as opposed to artificial light um, that's, uh, you know, through electricity. Um, and uh, while that may have been super effective in World War I today, it's totally unnecessary and obsolete. And I, for one, think we should get rid of daylight savings time. But if you're wondering where it came from, here you go. All right. The other thing, one of the other things that the government is doing at the on the home front during World War One is really trying to keep Americans loyal to their government, um, particularly after the Bolshevik uh, Revolution in Russia in 1917, right at the same time that the United States is getting involved in World War One. There's a real fear of um, spreading communism, which we'll talk more about in the future in this class. Um, but there's also a concern that maybe people are going to be more loyal to the country that their ancestors or their came from or that their family members are still in rather than the United States itself. Um, so there's this kind of fear of foreigners that emerges during World War I and becomes an ugly current in American history for the next couple decades and, and possibly even today, depending on who you ask. <clears throat> Donald Trump. Um, so uh, th this um, there's a, a 
a push for what's called 100% Americanism in our culture. Um, uh, there, we start implementing literacy tests at places like Ellis Island, these immigration intake centers, um, to really make sure that um, the right kind of people are coming into America and that American citizens are being held to ver a very consistent standard of what it means to really be America American. There's a lot of suspicion about um, potential spies during this time. There's a lot of hostility towards um, uh, Americans in the United States. The, the, remember the Creel Committee's um, shift into a more kind of hate-mongering rhetoric by the later stages of the war. Um, and this results in a couple kind of ugly uh, moments in our history. One is the repression of people's civil liberties, right? Your, your freedom of speech, your ability to speak your mind, maybe disagree with your government um, and tell them uh, kind of what your own opinion is. Um, gets curtailed during this time, in the same way that it has been at, at some times in our nation's past. Um, there's two acts that are passed called the Espionage and Sedition Acts um, during uh, this period, not to be confused with the Alien and Sedition Acts passed all the way back in John Adams' presidency at the beginning of the, of the Republic. Um, but these make it a crime, essentially, to speak out against the government um, and, and do not necessarily prosecute people um, for, uh, for, you know, protecting their First Amendment rights. Um, and this means that political radicals, people like Eugene Debs, who often speak out about the government, are going to be kind of closely watched or maybe thrown into jail during this time as well. Um, and we see this sort of, this, this idea seems very abstract, but it actually ends up coming out of people's mouths on a regular basis, um, starting in the 19-teens. We change our words in the United States for certain things that had been previously German. A hamburger, named after the city of Hamburg in Germany, becomes delicious Salisbury steak, still on school cafeteria menus everywhere today in 2016. German Shepherd dogs, oh my goodness, we can't have German dogs running around, we'll call them police dogs instead. So this seems kind of silly and it might seem kind of trivial, but the, the outcome of a lot of this um, nativist fear, this fear of foreigners, will end up contributing really dramatically to the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the weeks to come. Um, the Klan had been wiped out after Reconstruction. They come back in a vengeance and a lot of this, in the 1920s, and a lot of the seeds for that have been planted during World War I. All right, so let's, home front, we've got that covered. Let's talk a little bit about Americans overseas fighting in the war itself, or as um, it was called during the time, over there. I'm going to play you a song. Um, popular song from the time period called Over There. Here we go. Something in the background. This is actually a really famous singer whose name is Enrico Caruso. He's an opera singer uh, and a pop singer of the time. So um, not only is the war influencing things like daylight savings time and uh, what you think about your neighbors and maybe what you call your dog, but it's also influencing popular music during this time as well. Over There, which is the name of this song, ends up being a wildly popular song during the 19-teens. It's catchy. So, um, in order to make sure that we have enough soldiers to actually go and fight over there in Europe, uh, the United States passes um, a draft uh, in 1917, shortly after we declare war, the Selective Service Act, um, and 24 million Americans end up registering for the armed services as a result of this, which is huge. The people who um, are, are selected out of the draft, about 3 million of them initially, and then another million will be added over the course of the war, um, form what's called the American Expeditionary Force, or AEF. Um, so these troops are going to be tr briefly trained quickly and then thrown literally into combat. Um, they're transported across the Atlantic Ocean, which as we know is infested with German U-boats during this time, in convoys where a bunch of troop carriers are at the center and then you have a big ring of battleships and destroyers and warboats around them protecting them and keeping them safe. Not a single American life is lost due to a U-boat attack in getting troops um, over to Europe, which is kind of amazing. They arrive in France under uh, General John J. Pershing, whose name may be familiar to you. We have a lot of Pershing-related things in, in America today, or things that are named in his honor. Um, and, uh, and we essentially go to war. Um, these, these troops that are going over there are also segregated troops. They include African Americans. Um, they also include women, although not in combat roles. Um, although African Americans in World War I are relegated to like the least important combat duty. They're mostly doing menial tasks. They don't see a lot of action, um, which is deeply frustrating to soldiers who sign up patriotically to be able to defend their country um, and, uh, and are not really able to do so. Um, the 369th Infantry you may have heard of before, they're called the Harlem Hellfighters. And 
and they are more respected by the French government than by, they are by their own. They, they do see combat, um, they're, they're helpful to the French, and 